So uh, my name is George Luther. I'm a marine chemist at the School of Marine Science and Policy at the University of Delaware. And uh, my office and my group's lab uh, is in Lewis, Delaware. And we just moved back into a newly renovated lab, which we're all pretty pleased about. But we're not going to get a chance to enjoy it because we're going to have a chance to enjoy a research cruise at uh, East Pacific Rise, 9 degrees to 10 degrees north, about 500 miles due west of Costa Rica. And the cruise is funded by the National Science Foundation and the Marine Geology Geophysics Program. And the reason marine geology and geophysics is funding us is that we've done work on geochemistry in the past at hydrothermal vents. And we've shown that different types of iron nanoparticles are uh, emanating from the hydrothermal vent fluids. These fluids are about 360 degrees uh, in, the, in the actual chimneys. And this, this fluid comes out and interacts with cold seawater, which is 2 degrees Celsius. And all kinds of chemistry happens in the first one or two meters. Um, one of the things that we're looking at are nanoparticles. I should say more than one thing is nanoparticles of pyrite, iron silicates, and any other thing that comes out with metals. And you say, well, why would I be interested in metals? Well, in most marine organisms, metals are very important for enzymes. Uh, iron, we are an iron planet from the core, which is magnetic, to the mantle to the fluids that are emanating out of the crust where these chimneys are. And these nanoparticles of iron can go great distances. They may react. They, they may start out as iron sulfides and eventually become iron oxides. They may actually wind up bound to organic matter. And organisms are able to take this iron and use it. And the reason for this is that billions of years ago, before oxygen was in the atmosphere and in the seawater, we had a lot of dissolved, reduced iron. And organisms eventually decided, there's so much of this here, I'm just going to use it <laughs> for whatever purpose I need it for. And then when cyanobacteria started to take over the world, they produced oxygen. And iron that's reduced doesn't well, re it reacts really well with oxygen, and it forms what you know as rust, or iron oxides. And then what happens is that the solubility of iron becomes very low in seawater. So right now we have an oxygenated water column and planet in the atmosphere and we don't have that much iron compared to billions of years ago. So how does iron get to all these organisms in the middle of the ocean? Well some of it comes from atmospheric dust, from all the atmospheric uh, winds that pass all over the earth and a lot more comes, or at least maybe an equivalent amount, or uh, comes from hydrothermal vents, and we just don't know how many hydrothermal vents there are in the ocean, but there are plenty of them. So what is iron used for? Well, iron can be used to reduce nitrate, to form um, amine compounds and eventually amino acids and peptides, and that's basic building blocks of life. You use iron, for example, to breathe. You have a red blood cell. And a red blood cell is about 6 micrometers and it has iron, a very specific chemical comp composition, and the oxygen is actually in the red blood cell. Now, I don't know how many of you have been in the hospital, but they always monitor the amount of iron and oxygen in your, in your body. And it turns out that it gives you a nice little color, and they put this little device on your finger, and that actually is measuring the iron and oxygen in your hemoglobin. And if it's too low, they have to you know, give you more iron, or maybe they give you more oxygen so that you can have uh, better breathing and, and metabolic processes. Uh, so that's one of the things that we use iron for. Well, guess what? There's an organism down at the bottom of the vents, uh, near the vents, just off the side, maybe 25 degrees Celsius water at the at tops, and it is a animal that fixes carbon dioxide like a plant but it has red blood cells just as you and I do with the same pH of the blood, 7.4. And what happens is that these organisms have a beautiful red plume. And the oxygen and the nutrients go across this plume, the carbon dioxide, the hydrogen sulfide. And it goes down to about a grapefruit size um, thing that we call a trophosome. And that's where the bacteria are. And these bacteria fix carbon dioxide through the reaction of hydrogen sulfide and oxygen 
to form sugars. And I always tell my students, and particularly the young people that I talk with, think about it. They haven't, they don't have a mouth. All these chemicals assimilate across this beautiful red bloom. And next thing you know, they have, it's like having a cotton candy machine in your belly. And think about it. You never have to eat, but you have all this great sugar. I don't know. I think I'd like to eat the cotton candy, actually. <laughs> but this is an interesting organism. It grows from something really, really small to something that's two meters or two yards tall. And I actually have some other polysaccharide. I don't know if you can see this, but the Riftia bacchiptola is this one. This is a very, very thin one. So this is the one that grows two meters tall, and it has a, a collar, if you will, like this, and the plume comes out of the column, sort of like this, and it just takes all these nutrients, and then it goes back in, and it's happy. Then there's another organism, which is more ribbed with its polysaccharides. It's called Tevnia. And so what we're seeing with Tevnia is the same kind of metabolic features. It's just smaller. It can actually live in lower oxygen concentration zones. Now, even though this isn't the primary part of our study, we've done a lot of work with these organisms in the past, and we're bringing some colleagues on our crews to study some of the iron chemistry that might be going on with these organisms. So not only are we studying the iron nanoparticles emanating from the vents, we're trying to understand something about how other organisms use iron. And one of the things on a cruise that we have, we try to operate the, the ship 24 hours a day, okay, seven days a week, 365 days a year, because they're not inexpensive to run. If you'd like to know, it'll cost about $70,000 a day between the mothership and the deep sea submersible Alvin that we will be using on this cruise. So that's a lot of money, and we feel that we have to do as much work as we possibly can. Uh, to make sure our taxpayers get their, their money's worth.